Well, I'm very pleased to be here and to see all of you and to talk with you a little bit about the history of Logo and I subtitled this a Computer Language to Grow With and you can decide what that means. Um, friends of mine, when I gave them the title, objected. <laughs> so, um, I, in uh, thinking about Logo, I have two major mentors in my life. Seymour Papert was one of them, and Seymour was the originator of Logo. And my other mentor is, was Marvin Minsky. And <clears throat> Marvin and Seymour collaborated for about 20 years, very closely. One breathed and the other did, you know, with that kind of very close relationship. And originally, their focus was on thinking about machines and how to make them think. And in the process, also thinking about how children think. And <clears throat> how thinking about that there might be some ways to help children think better about their own thinking. Um, there, Marvin and Seymour collaborated in 1964 on robotics, vision, and their students. And so there's this, um, let me just get it going. Um, there, there's a, this video. We decided that would be interested to see if we could get computers. This is Marvin. Do things out in the real world in the early 1960s. And so we had to do a lot of engineering to build interfaces between television cameras and the computer and mechanical hands. So we had to make a machine that would find some blocks and build something with them. And the programming problem was Basically, we had a table with a lot of objects, and we built an object. I guess a good example would be that. And then we confront the machine with this thing and say, build another one. Most of this research was very hard, long projects to do the simplest kind of thing that you'd think that any intelligent being would know how to do without even trying it. But then if you watch what a 18-month-old child does or a two-year-old child uh, any afternoon when it's playing with them, <laughs> on for a long time. If you, if you slow down the video and watch the hundreds of experiments a kid will do every uh, few minutes, then when people talk about the attention span of a child, you realize that uh, they do things that very few adults would ever dream of working that hard on. I apologize for the quality of the video, but that was shot um in uh, 480 by whatever, you know, low res for today, but high res for that time, which was in the early 90s. Oh, see, I'm not good at this. Stop it. Oops. So, Logo was born in 1966. It, it started at a company called Bolt, Boranic and Newman, a research company in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And um, I, I was part of the education technology group and Seymour was a consultant. And there were a couple of projects. We thought of Logo, we all had a list background, so we thought of Logo as baby list. We got rid of the parentheses <laughs> and there was no lambda and um, <clears throat> uh, the first versions of Logo were weird. But anyway, that was our model. 
and uh, here's a picture of Seymour um, and uh, his great thing was that children deserved a computer language of their own. The, um, the work at BBN, there, were, um, there was a project using a language called Telcomp, which was based on JAWS, which is, was an algebraic language very similar to BASIC. And um, it was being used by children, and Seymour was particularly struck by the children learning algebra using an algebraic language. They didn't understand algebra, and they certainly didn't understand the algebraic language. Um, <clears throat> so that was uh, Seymour really sort of say, exploding with ideas about a language for children. And um, I want to just say a little bit about his background. Seymour um, was always interested in children, <coughs> but before he joined Marvin in 1964, he had spent five years with Jean Piaget in Geneva. And Piaget is the person that showed us that children are thinkers. They are theorists. They have ideas. They're not empty vessels. They're not following a behaviorist principle that we could just open their, you know, I love it. You, you open your, their brains and pour the information in. And Piaget showed us that children indeed have their own theories. They're not adult theories. And um, so that's a theme that runs through Logo, respecting children's ideas and expecting them to contribute. So um, I want to just play you this video of Seymour because <clears throat> it brings out who Seymour was. Again, it's a low res, I'm sorry, but it exists. I was having a conversation with some kids about two reds. Yeah. There's two of them. Three-year-old, she's going on to four, it's a red. I was visiting a school where she had preschool, and she had heard that I grew up in Africa. When I came there, she said, she was obviously just waiting for me. She caught me, and she said, <laughs> she had a question, how did you ever sleep? How did you sleep? And I had to admit, yeah. That point in class, that quick. So I said, well, let's think about it. So we started talking. Now we have a bunch of kids around. And they started making theory. And they were very interesting. I mean, now she explained why she really cared about that. Because she recently got a puppy. Now when she sleeps, she is like, I'm going to get her arms open. She saw the puppy did the same thing. So she thought of giraffe. Poor giraffe, it's head so far away. <laughs> Cut its, its, its head and its arms. What does it do? So this is where she got passion to She asked me she could. So these kids started making them. Well, let's try. What do you do? Do you know that? Do you know? I have no idea. Okay, then tell me. How did you just make a theory? What did you think? Maybe we did a proper head against the tree. How long? No. Well, but so the kid said exactly that. And she did this with her hands. She said, of course, plants a tree. <laughs> this is interesting. I said, now I'm growing up. What if they're the trees? So what do you think she said? I don't know. She got a beach in between. Well, she stood with the utter disdain and she said, of course there are trees. <laughs> That's why giraffes have such long legs so that they can be <laughs> the trees on the top of the trees. So where there are giraffes, there are trees. <laughs> but I thought this was fantastic right. Mm -hmm. And so were the various other theories that I did. And it made me think of course oh, no, 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 we have come kind of Double standard about how we talk to kids, especially with teachers. If they come up with a cute theory like that, or another one, then suddenly, period, how do the, what makes the wicked? 
So a lot of kids say the clouds make the wind. Other kids say the trees make the wind. And I had some kids who told me the trees make the wind. And I had to tell them, made, how do you know? And they did this. <laughs> There's a little bit of wind from just one hand. And the tree's branches are so much bigger than your hand. And there are so many of them. <laughs> of course that can make a huge wind. Now I thought that's a very good logic kid before. It just doesn't happen to be meteorologically orthodox. <laughs> but this is the contrary. We get, we love it when kids come up with these beautiful theories. Because instinctively we know that this is what's important. Kids thinking, making theories. And these this is quality thinking in this. It's not not ridiculous that you this thing about making the wind look at it and quantitate itself. The giraffe story, especially with this whole thing, where it introduces trees because the giraffe doesn't exist in the Sahara Desert. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry that, that it was a little hard to hear. I apologize for that. I have to work on that. Um, if, if this was a student of Seymour's who built that giraffe, the mechanical giraffe there, which is what got the whole... Uh, she was an MIT student and did that. Oh, oops. So here's the team that, uh, 1966, there's Seymour and me, Danny Barbaro, who... Um, was head of the AI group at VBN and also had just uh, finished his doctoral work with Marvin and Seymour. And, um, and then there w and he, Danny, of course, was a LISP enthusiast. And then Wally Feuerzeig, who was head of the education technology group. And so I explained here what their backgrounds were. Um, and there was a, a one other person whose picture I don't have. He um, was a programmer, part of the EdTech group, and had been a math undergraduate at MIT. So after presenting to us the ideas for Logo, and the Logo he presented us with was very different from the eventual version of Logo, but by 1967, we had a working logo. Danny had started implementing it in LISP on this SDS time, 940 time-shared computer at BBN. It was a pretty powerful computer. And um, we had teletypes as communication devices. And we, uh, Seymour taught a group of children for a couple of weeks using this logo, and Wally and I were observers, and Seymour and I had great um, deb bu uh, <laughs> uh, sessions afterwards discussing. And I have a picture there of um, the Beatles' Lonely Hearts Club band, because it was released in 1967, so I thought it would give you a perspective. Um, Anyway, after that experience, we totally revised Logo and implemented it um, on some machine called Digital Equipment's PDP-1. And that's what a PDP-1 looked like. BBN had the f first or second PDP-1 in 1961. And in fact, uh, John McCarthy, who was the author of LISP and a professor eventually at Stanford, but was at MIT at the time, he built the first time-sharing system. Do you know about time-sharing? Um, a lot of people don't. The, the great, and it was at BBN on this type of machine that John's ideas for uh, time sharing got implemented. Um, it meant that more than one person could use a computer at the same time. It, you know, we didn't get laptops 
until the 90s, the 80s. Uh, so just think before then, computers were very expensive, but people were using them at the, all over the place with, um, you know, time sharing. So, in 1968-69, Seymour and I team taught a group of 12-year-olds. Um, we call them seventh graders. And um, this was at a, sco a, local, a school local to BBN. We had um, 12 children, 12 teletypes. Some of them were Model 35s, and some of them were Model 33s. And this is a look into the classroom that we were given. Um, everything was uppercase. OK, all communication with the computer was in uppercase. <laughs> we were lucky we had communication. So the, the, the PDP-1 was back at DBN, and over phone lines, we had these 12 systems working. And uh, that was a rarity. One machine, one uh, input device to the other. So there's Seymour with some kids. And um, there's me. And there's two girls at a teletype, each of them. Those were Model 35s, I can tell. And one of the, the kinds of projects we did, with, I, in fact, I didn't start the teaching, nor did Seymour. Uh, we had a regular math teacher who hadn't much experience with computing. And her idea of introducing kids was to teach them syntax. And it, I, I went away, and when I came back and visited, I was very surprised that feedback wasn't given to her, that that was probably not a good way of doing things. Anyway, what happened is Seymour and I team taught. We took over the teaching, and it, everything was project-based with us. And the kinds of projects we did, because I, Logo was designed to be a programming language to play with words and sentences. We didn't have any turtles, or I mean, we were lucky we had a language for children. One of the projects which this displays was making English sentences up. And um, the, 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 one of the surprising comments that the children gave, because their first example, the first time they made the, their programs run, um, it, the sentences were garbled. And their reaction was, oh, that's why they call them nouns and verbs. And uh, here's an example of logo code to generate English sentences. So what the kids did was have a procedure. So logo was procedural. And I have a procedure for, with a collection of nouns, verbs, adjectives, um, and sen et cetera. And then a, a super procedure that put those things together. Sengen was the super procedure. And that given the vocabulary there, that's the kind of sentence that got generated. And um, I remember a, a math educator at the time had been begging me to come and visit. And finally, I said, OK. And she came into the, mat, into the classroom and went out pulling her hair. Where's the math, she said, thinking that there was no mathematics to this experience. And because uh, there weren't any, you know. But what this led to, if she had come back the next week, she would have seen. Um, what this led to was generating um, simple math sentences. 
So here's an example of a logo code that generated the kind of proposed like five times box plus 10 equals 35, what is box? We avoided uh, talking about variables. We avoided talking about X and Y. We could give, in the Lisp tradition, we could give things long names. We could give procedures long names, and we could give things. We, call, we thought about things long names. And um, so we refer to this as box. And as you can see here, it would repeat the question until you got the right answer. It didn't help you. Later, the, the, the kids worked on projects like this that would help the user. Um, the other thing, kinds of projects we did, my rule with them was, if you play a game, because they all want to play games, you have to write it. So um, the project that we did with them uh, was one pile NIM. And in, in the debugging process, we introduced this little person, in those days, little man model, and um, as a way of tracing through the behavior of your procedures. So um, NIMPLAY took three inputs, and uh, one guy spoke to another guy, spoke to another guy, and eventually uh, procedures came back. So underlying ideas for LOGO were, were definitely procedural thinking, debugging, uh, project-based learning, talking. We really encouraged kids to talk about what they were doing. And we, we thought of, as we said, we gave them words and sentences to play with. And we also did a lot of identifying and encouraged them to identify with their procedures. And in the debugging process, to, to identify with the procedures and their own bugs. Um, so Logo became the name of a programming language, a programming environment, and a culture. And the culture encouraged a way of thinking about computers and about learning. And as I said, it was based, it really was based on ways of helping people think about their own thinking, reflecting. So after that project, Seymour, who was a professor at MIT anyway, we left BBM and started the Logo group as part of the MIT AI lab. And um, so there's a picture of Marvin with arms. He designed an arm and students, uh, this is just an aside, in the early 70s, we're working on Blocks Worlds, the AI students, in case you're interested. <laughs> um, anyway, here are more pictures. And one of the, uh, I think Logo wouldn't have shaped up the way it did if it hadn't been part of the AI lab, because there was this wonderful world of, that Marvin encouraged that of uh, respecting students and um, they um, students uh, and um, and uh, randoms were attracted to the ease with which they had access to computing with Marvin and with a, a, a couple of other people. And as opposed to, at that time, uh, the major way of communicating with a computer was through punch card decks. And uh, you submitted your deck. If you didn't drop it, it ran. And maybe the next day, you got results. 
so the process of debugging was really weird in those days and um, this is a group of hackers brilliant people who were playing um, Richard Greenblatt's mag hack the first um, chess program that uh, went into tournaments. I mean, it didn't win them all or anything, but it, uh, it did play in tournaments. And uh, it, I have to point out, the, and then a lot of these people were earlier part of a group that built Space War, the first programming, uh, the first uh, really interesting computer game on a PDP-1. Um, it was the only game I could stand playing. I was not. <laughs> and um, anyway, and, and the thing about this group also were, so the, the philosophy was um, you could do almost anything, you, but when you got into trouble, you could get yourself out or find somebody to help you. Um, there wasn't, the term hacker was positive. It's still used in the AI people as a positive thing. But today, outside of that world, it's considered negative. These people were not um, destroyers. They were builders, and um, it made quite a difference. Um, anyway, um, in 1970, I'm jumping around. In 1970, we had um, a floor turtle and a display turtle. The result of this 1969 experience was that it, Words and sentences were great, but we needed something more concrete for them to play with. And Seymour came up with the idea of turtles. And because we were with these great hackers, and some of them did incredible graphics work, um, we got, they understood that about turtles. And Marvin was very instrumental in directing the development of floor turtles. Um, Mar Marvin was a builder. He, in fact, made, we, we had a four-voice music box for Logo, and Marvin built it for us. So um, anyway, the first big public presentation was uh, April 11th, when um, there was a conference, a one-day symposium called Teaching Children Thinking. Um, and we had, um, is, well, what it said, Marvin led a, a panel discussion with Alan Newell um, and Bob, da Bob Davis was an, a math educator who eventually became prominent in the Plato Math Education Project, um, if you know what Plato was, but you can look it up. Um, and Pat Sufis, who was the standard for behaviorist approach to um, CAI, Computer Assisted Instruction. Do you know what that is? You don't know what computer-assisted instruction. Well, in those days, it was um, uh, giving kids problems and waiting for the correct solutions. Lots of them. Drill and practice is another name for it. Do you know what that was? OK, well, that's what Sufi's. He was the most successful. He had a very successful company. And he was at Stanford, and that was, you know. Anyway, here is, um, in 1970-71, Seymour and I taught fifth grade, 10-year-olds at a school near MIT, and we had finally a display turtle. That 
was a vector display driven by a, a general, um, I forget, a super, a Nova, and then over the phone line back to the PDP-10 at MIT where there was a logo running. And instead of having teletypes, we had that great execupor. But still things were in uppercase. <laughs> and there's Marvin's music box. It had four voices. And there was two kinds of, the yellow turtle was, um, its parts were found in a um, DOD dumping station. <laughs> and the other one was this, uh, the first one that was built in the AI lab. And um, so here's the kind of graphics that kids did. And this is, we always had some kind of animation. And it, that is an example of the kind of animation we had. Um, oh yes, I'm not too, and um, this is what people think of when they think of a uh, logo. They, they, they think of uh, turtle geometry, turtle graphics, and this is, um, there are two procedures there. One's called poly, and the figures on the left are drawn by Polly and the Polly spy, which um, makes spirals. And what's the difference? Out of this, uh, the most powerful idea that came from this, we thought, was the total turtle trip theorem, which meant that if the turtle turns um, a multiple of 360, um, and it cons goes forward a consistent amount, it will come back to its starting state. And so there you see that the poly, given different inputs, draws close figures. And the poly spy, since it changes its step size each time, um, Never, the turtle never returns to its starting state. Um, and so here's another example of the floor turtle. And kids call that squirrel even though it was triangular. But, and this is Seymour in um, 19, the spring of 1972. Let us now learn mathematics by speaking in mathematics about things that really matter. So at MIT we were given computers to power turn motors, to make sounds, to draw pictures. And we found ways of giving children the power to control the computer. Now they put their little tunes together to make a bigger one. Oh, yes, and this is one of the other things we introduce kids to is sort of circus arts. What are ways of thinking procedurally? And so we, had, we taught them to walk on stilts and juggle, and ride a unicycle, and bongo board. And this is Seymour on the bongo board and me pushing him. Whoops, I'll go back to it. Uh, I'll just, 
and um, he was very good at that. This one is an example of a child on the bongo board. <laughs> so, actually, yeah. Oh, come on. So, anyway, this is just another sum a summation of, of logo environment. And this environment continued. Um, what was um, interesting, I expect, I'm having a reunion this week. In 1972, we went to Exeter, England, and I went there with a crew from the AI lab with a PDP-11, digital equipment PDP-11, that Dick had sold to Exeter, the University of Exeter. So they also, we had a new version of Logo running on this PDP-11. And we also had, um, the, the guys had designed a turtle graphics uh, terminal. And so uh, that also went with us in the music box and a couple of the turtle, floor turtles. Went to Exeter with us and I went there three or four weeks before the conference and I had set up to work with children. And um, I'm meeting with three of the 12 year olds this week. Um, of course they're now pushing 60. But um, I haven't seen them. But one of them, one of them, his name is Jonathan Pledge, got written up in Hal Abelson's book, Turtle Geometry. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a free download these days. And um, he, John, uh, um, Hal called him John, but his name was Jonathan. And what he developed, um, um, Using turtles was very new to us at that time. And Jonathan is credited with the maze escaping program. And this just, if I took this from Hal's book, you're welcome to read it. And that was pretty exciting for us that this 12 year old um, did, did this. And one of the things that came from uh, being in Exeter, England, was we started a company called General Turtle. And the intention, Seymour's brother, who had, uh, was in, was in, I forget where he was, uh, in England somewhere, he joined us in the States and Marvin and Seymour and me and a couple of other people and Alan Papert, Seymour's brother, started this company. And the intention was to make turtles available because... Um, <laughs> and one of the results was Marvin designed a um, logo computer. Um, and uh, I have a video of Marvin saying how it was cheap. This is just before lap, uh, personal computing hit the stage, like a year before or something. This was uh, 74, 74 about. And um, <laughs> Marvin said it was cheap. It was only $5,000. And um, here's what the, it was, um, vector graphics and this is a kind of uh oh come on this was the kind of graphics you could do it was kind it was really nice you could spin and then go forward and then spin and go forward and um it became a business computer for a while because it couldn't it, it didn't compete with i mean with the little laptops. So another thing that was going on at the AI lab was um, 
this uh, radio program at that time was an undergraduate and she created a button box so that, and a special um, version called tortoise of the logo system so she was working with three-year-olds and they were talking to the turtle through this button box um, Another important element was in uh, having multiple turtles in colors. And that happened because of a sprite board. Actually, the original sprite board was built by Danny Hillis, a student of Marvin's, an undergraduate at MIT at the time. Uh, and eventually, Texas Instruments took it over, and so the first version uh, was this, where you could have 32 turtles. It was very exciting. And then the next in, uh, big thing for me was um, we formed another company, Marvin and Seymour and me, and, and uh, some other people called um, Logo computer systems, which sort of still uh, exists. And um, there had been a version of Logo for the, the little Apple computers. Um, but as a company, we made a whole new version. And Apple called, it was uh, a sort of an Apple product. Um, I, I wrote this introductory thing, and we worked very hard on the graphics for the little book. And um, here's an ad that Apple ran for um, Apple logo. And one of the things that hits me is that Apple logo runs on the Apple II with 64K of memory. And, um, you know, that's what fits on a credit card uh, these days. Uh, but anyway, so the next thing for me was Alan Kay. I don't know how many of you know. Alan Kay is the small talk person, and a lot of you people are involved with small talk. Uh, um, um, Alan has a history. Had, before he went to park, he came to visit me and Seymour and the children and said that his environment had to do what we did and more. So the base for the early small talk, early small talk was a language for children where there was going to be heavy duty graphics, great word processing, and a powerful programming language. Um, anyway, uh, he became a uh, uh, chief scientist for Atari, and he set me up with a research lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We lasted for two years, and uh, then Atari got closed and bought and sold and whatever. And a lot of the things we did, including some of the people, became part of the media lab, which started when in 1984, or they say five, but people started in four. So um, this is a short video talking about what the The research has been motivated by our past experiences in the logo group at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, where we worked with Seymour Packard and Marvin Linsky. We looked at ways to control computers through gestures, by touch, by gross body movement. We designed an object-oriented logo and developed applications in it. We built several mechanical devices to add new dimensions to computing environments. We began to build tools toward a musical PlayStation. And as always, we continued our work with children. <laughs> So um, 
the things when we close, the things that uh, the, the joyce, the force feedback joystick went to MIT and became somebody's doctoral work and they built a better one later but initially there was that and a few other things and whoops and one of the other things that came about was um, Margaret Minsky, Brian Harvey and I edited a collection of Atari logo pro projects that our good friends wrote and um, since Atari shut down this book is uh, didn't last long and uh, as far as uh, the logo history uh, Seymour got involved with Lego and there was a version of logo called Lego logo when the um, when the first uh, versions of uh, uh, you know motors and so on with Lego came out um, Lego logo was part of the package but then Lego decided to scrap Lego logo and go with uh, lab view for um, the programming language anyway going to, for today I'm going on too long um, here's an example of how to make a turtle geometry image in um, well turtle art which is a, a dedicated environment to turtle graphics uh, written by Brian Silverman then it, there's an example of how to write the same sort of thing in logo and then there's an example of how to write a similar thing in snap um, snap for those of you who don't know it um, is based on scratch um, it, it um, is designed by Brian Harvey who was a logo enthusiast and a great uh, programmer um, and it gave you um, first-class objects it gave you procedures and so on that scratch doesn't have um, I can't really do turtle geometry easily in scratch because of the way the um, sprites are organized and you can see in in uh, snap there's something that has a heading that I can see that's little turtle sprite and this is um, I had to uh, oh, well anyway this is an example of writing an art for see I'm going on my new project I have to talk to you I'm pushing it I'm advertising this is my book um, <coughs> I am and I edited it I only wrote one little piece in it it's a collection of um, essays by Marvin Minsky so um, it's about thinking and about helping children to think and there were six essays this is my co-editor her name is Xiao Xiao and she also made 80 illustrations for the book she's um, she's in Marvin's living room on a trapeze and Marvin is sitting on the couch it's very poor quality everything is but and um, she was an undergraduate at MIT and she got her doctorate at the media lab and she knew Marvin then because her masters and doctorate work were on music she was a fantastic pianist but she also here she is I just she just sent me this picture um, her her master thesis she could see Marvin playing and she could copy play with him um, and that uh, anyway that was uh, her master's thesis so 
Um, these are just some of her great drawings, and they mean something if you read the book. I'm not going on to what they are. <clears throat> this is um, this young lady. <laughs> I she's I definitely a, recommend getting it, uh, especially since so each of there's six essays in the book, and each of them is prefaced uh, by some introductory remarks uh, by just incredibly impressive people uh, re related to like cognitive science and especially computer science. Like Alan Kay writes the intro for the first essay. It's just such a delight to read. Like Alan Kay's fantastic. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I enjoy it because it's sort of you can you get a sense of different tone from each of these people introducing the essays, um, and you sort of I think build a little bit of an intuition around the fact that people really do think very differently. Okay, I didn't pay her. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody sent me this, she posted it on her um, Facebook account, oh, Twitter account. Um, I whoops, stop. I yeah. And <laughs> this is a wonderful interview of Marvin talking about, if I can find it. So one of the troubles with education theory until recently is that people have this idea that the best way to learn is to make it a positive experience. Everything should be good. The child should be guided to make very small steps so that they can't make any serious mistakes and then you learn everything. And when you're all done, you can do the job without thinking because you know exactly what to do. Well, I don't think that kind of learning leads to uh, becoming very good at new problems because you haven't learned enough about bugs. So what we've really got to do is to teach children to enjoy being wrong. <laughs> yes. And one of them. Um, so and these are, uh, this is just an advertisement for my book. And uh, these are the wonderful people that contributed to the book. And um, I think that's enough. I think that's I'm right. My newest project is being on advising this company, Tinker, which has been using a version of Scratch and making things for kids. They want my advice. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I looked at some of the stuff and I found a few bugs. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see what happens. And um, here's Xiao Xiao again, I think. Or who? I think this is Xiao. Oh yeah, the, I played this for you in the beginning, right? And those of you who missed it, here it is. Xiao Xiao, for the past two and a half years, taught herself the theremin. And she said, So, um, Well, I'm going to stop it. I'm going to stop it, if I can. <laughs> um, and see, uh, I went on a lot. I could go on more. I didn't give you a lot of details like I would have loved to. It just gave you a lot of history. And Heather, 
here just told me that when she was a kid, she's not a kid anymore. Slightly older now. Bill Theremin's. And I thought that was pretty remarkable because a lot of people never heard of a theremin, didn't know what it was. And here I have come across a theremin expert. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> this is very, they're very simple things, but little oscillators are not very. Yeah, I, you can make a very bad one. That's what I made. I made a very bad one. <laughs> so you. the last thing is buy my book. Yes. <laughs> So we have some time for questions, if you'd like to, to take a few now. We also have um, a, a question and answer session for we have some cu computing education folks um, from the UK here. Uh, and I, I am told that there is a room for you all to go have a Q&A with Cynthia. But uh, ahead of that, um, would you like to take some questions now? I mean, we can take some questions with the audience. Are you? I, I'm happy to take questions. One other thing I didn't tell you, where is Tomas? He's there. He's the shepherd. <laughs> we are writing for the special interest group on programming languages, a history of logo. And there are five or six of us that are, that are involved, and we're all opinionated. And it's been quite a process. <laughs> but he's our shepherd. <laughs> Questions? Anybody? Right oh. there. Yep, we have. Sophia. Uh, Sophia Drosopoulou, Imperial College. Thank you very much for a wonderful history of, uh, of this uh, endeavor. I was wondering, do we have any data about what happened with the children that were taught? And ideally, uh, uh, children that, were, uh, that received some other kind of uh, tuition, like uh, intensive maths or intensive uh, uh, music. Do we have any data? Well, um, there have been, see, tiny little research projects. What I have, have gotten is mostly people coming up to me saying their experience changed their lives, that they uh, decided to, like the ones I'm having a reunion with, uh, these Brits, they they become computer scientists and that wasn't what they thought about doing when they were 12 but after the experience they had so i keep having people come up to me and tell me how it changed how having a logo experience changed their lives and i've also had uh, people come up and tell me they wish it had but the kind of teaching that they experienced was not the kind of teaching we would like to see. And uh, it was more the, the Pat Sufi's model of you, that you do this, and it's, there's only one way of doing things. This, there's, a, that, there's a lot of interesting work that's been done by Richard Noss and Celia Hoyles in Britain they got very, uh, very involved with Seymour and doing logo projects that um, their math educators that were well documented. Yep. Simon. Hi, I'm Simon Peyton Jones. Well, early on in your talk, Cynthia, you said something about um, that one of the early aspirations of logo was to encourage children to think about thinking. And I know that comes up in some of Papert's writing. I, I just, but you didn't elaborate on that at all in what followed. So I wondered if you could take a moment to say what you had in mind there. Well, um, that debugging was part of the process of getting kids or ourselves to think about thinking. And the kind of debugging we experienced and did with uh, uh, logo was, as I said, anthropomorphic thinking. Seymour called it body syntonic eventually, but in the early days was anthropomorphic thinking. And that is that um, identifying with the procedures I was 
I would create or the child would create and the bugs that would occur would be similar to bugs that were in me. And, uh, and the process of articulating what they were doing was all getting them to reflect on their own thinking and to see that it's possible to debug their thinking because they could debug these procedures. Hi, uh, David Schmoody. I'm with Next Journal. Um, over the course of your career, <clears throat> have you seen uh, much anecdotal difference between teaching children symbolic thinking uh, versus physical thinking? So today, because the graphics are more powerful, we see more blocks and snapping things together. Um, is there an advantage or disadvantage or something that's being lost by doing less symbolic thought, which is, you know, symbols, which are letters that are associated with concepts versus physical, uh, physically putting pieces together, which is an unembodied experience. Well, that brings up for me the maker movement. And the early maker movement, uh, people were building things and not reflecting on why they were building or what the bugs were in the process of building. And things are changing with the maker movement now because it's been around a little bit and they see the flaws. I think that's a big, big flaw in not talking about, um, not having a language to talk about the bugs they, that are incurred. In, um, I, I've been working in a, um, a center in Boston, a very interesting place uh, where there's maker stuff and I've been working with people on thinking, uh, on trying to articulate what the bugs are and that makes a big difference. Mark Campbell from Ada College of National Digital Skills. Um, I was really interested in when you were talking about project-based learning, and I think it's something that, thankfully, some of us are starting to come back to. And I think the idea of a much more integrated curriculum and learning through debugging, where it, debugging is integral rather than accidental. Right. And I think that's something that we miss, it, where the sum of the parts is less than the whole. And we really have got to go back right. to an integrated curriculum, in my opinion. Thank you. I, I, that's what I was trying to say. Thank you. And, and my emphasis, like picking the interview with Marvin, where he talks about being wrong. Marvin would always say, you can't learn without um, bugs and debugging. So that's, I'm, all, I'm surprised that today that's not more in the language. Uh, it was, it's just part of me and part of the logo that you think about bugs as positive until they're really obnoxious. <laughs> Hi, uh, Julia Belkova, Northeastern University. At some point you mentioned in the context of MIT students that uh, they could always ask for help if something is going wrong. I wonder if you encourage children as well to help each other or more encourage them to try and to solve the problem on their own. Uh, how did you work with children on that? Well, I've never worked with a group of children without learning something totally unexpected and totally <laughs> new. And um, I, all, I mean, the point of uh, teaching is facilitating, but not just being a facilitator, being a teacher. And um, with children anyway, giving them some suggestions and ideas and models for what they can do, try to find, uh, what I've always done is try to find what interests them and uh, in the background, work on those. I mean, that's what a teacher does, right? Uh, did you also encourage them to help each other? Oh, yes. 
the wonderful thing is kids teaching other kids. I, I did a lot of that. And in this center that I uh, hang out in sometimes, there's a program called Teach to Learn, Learn to Teach. And they, the high, there are high school students who go and teach um, elementary school students. They're about to start it for the summer. And um, it's always, the first reaction is always, um, they don't listen to me. <laughs> As they daydream in their classes, yes. Thank you. Hi, um, Richard Millwood from Trinity College, Dublin. Um, Cynthia, my great admiration for you starts with the fact that you were prepared back in 1966 to challenge the design of tools, to throw away the brackets from LISP, to be radical in your design for children to learn. Uh, and this, this conference I've discovered is a lot about designing tools and, and perfecting them. What advice would you offer to the designers of tools here to help us in education with new tools for learning now in 2019? And, um, well, one of the things, this row of people are teachers. And Simon has organized them to come. And I think you need more of that. You need not to separate developers from users. Um, and, and let users help build. Um, I have a, a, a good friend who was part of a group called Participatory Learning. And they, they work with getting children to participate. And she often asked me um, about children in the early logo days. And the, the difference in the early logo days is the kids had no models for what's possible. So um, it was not, it was, we didn't do things outside of the environment that we helped them to work in. Is that? I think that's, um, that's all we have time for, but I, I believe Cynthia will be around a little bit after the, the, the meeting that she has with the teaching folks. So let's thank Cynthia for coming all the way out. Here. <laughs>